Hello everyone, my name is Tux Albert and I would like to share my own thoughts on Star Wars Jedi Knight Mysteries of the Sith, the expansion pack to Star Wars Jedi Knight Dark Forces 2 and the third game in the Dark Forces series. This game here is an expansion pack that is a little bit in the tradition of the 90s mission pack expansion pack. You for the most part take the role of Mara Jade, who's most well known as a character from the Star Wars Extended Universe, now Legends Canon, and the love interest of Luke Skywalker at one point. This game here takes place five years after the events of Dark Forces 2. Kyle and Mara are now Master and Apprentice, but they do teach one another. Kyle has been downgraded a little bit, which is understandable, because if he had all his powers from the main game, he'd be a Jedi Grandmaster. And you do actually play him during the first of four acts and you'd probably just be too powerful and do not offer enough for a challenge for the rest of the game. The game is for the most part what you know from the main game, even though there are some new weapons, some new enemies, new environments naturally, and also a slightly altered system for the force powers. But we're going to get to that. The game is, as mentioned before, divided in four acts, and story-wise, these are not really connected all that well. You do get the introductory cutscene and the text from the manual, which establishes the situation, and then you have one act, and each of these acts is divided in a couple of missions, 14 in total, where you have to protect a rebel base from an imperial attack, one where you have to convince a powerful crime lord to support the Republic, one where you protect a Republic ship with important cargo, and the final one where you find yourself on a planet with an old Sith temple. The last one is the only one that really advances the story, but primarily for Kyle, not so much for Mara, and also explains the, the situation at the start of Star Wars Jedi Knight Jedi Outcasts, but we're going to get to that soon enough. The, the regard, with regard to story, the game is still fine. You do have a bunch of events. They don't really line up nicely, and you could skip from the introductory cutscene right to the fourth act. and wouldn't really miss anything, but the story is serviceable. For the most part, you do get a couple of cutscenes that just explain, oh, you have to go here, and now we met this person, and now the situation has changed a little bit, and you need to go to that place. It is serviceable, but it's not particularly thrilling until the final act. The game does no longer have full motion video cutscenes. Instead, we do have pre-rendered cutscenes, and which is understandable, because as an expansion pack, this probably has a slightly uh, lower budget, and that it wouldn't have to rehire all the the actors and do the, I guess, somewhat extensive special effects with all the CGI and the lightsabers, which for the time probably was a bit more expensive than it would be today. So we do get pre-rendered cutscenes which look absolutely terrible. The quality is really bad. And while the game is obviously old, this game here is from from the late 90s. And there are games that look way better and also games that had way better looking cutscenes. So this came out not long before Half-Life. Of course, Half-Life was a little bit of a, a watershed. It was exceptional for its time, so that's not really a standard. But nevertheless, if you jump from, from Half-Life to this, it's a little bit of a downgrade. And the cutscenes at this point are almost comically bad. The characters are fairly low poly, and the action isn't terribly convincing either, because the models aren't really designed to make the most natural-looking movements, but the, the cutscenes serve well enough to, enough to advance the plot. In this regard, to the new equipment we have. You do have all your old weapons, but you do start immediately with a lightsaber, both as Kyle and as Mara, and you don't have to rely on your arsenal of weapons that much, but nevertheless, you do get a couple of new weapons that are actually interesting, even though some of them are also a little bit tacked on. As for the new weapons, you do have Han Solo's blaster that can be charged, which is kind of nice to have, but not really needed. You do have a rocket launcher with seeking missiles. That one is actually really good. Not only is it powerful, but aiming is so much easier with that. 
So that's a really nice addition. You do not get a whole lot of ammunition for it, but that's understandable. But it is a lot of fun to use once you do have ammunition for it. You also have the carbonite gun. And the carbonite gun is incredibly gimmicky. Firstly, it's a weapon that turns people into carbonite statues, like, the, like Han Solo was in The Empire Strikes Back. Firstly, that's not really a standard procedure, is it? It's not like everybody just does that around the Star Wars universe. That's just something where they went, oh, so this is an Empire Strikes Back. I guess we have to force this in here. So and have one aspect from the main films define an entire type of weapon. And not only that, but this weapon is mainly useless. The range isn't all that great. You have to shoot most targets multiple times before they freeze. Well, freeze is instant death. If you need multiple shots, it's not really instant death. And then when if you don't destroy the statue quickly enough, they will actually come back to life. And if you do destroy it, then you can actually be hurt by the debris and the splinters that fly around when you destroy the statue. It is incredibly gimmicky and it has almost no application. You, what you can do is turn invisible using the fourth and then have a little bit of fun or you could just stab people with your lightsaber really. So this weapon, it feels very tacked on. You don't really get all that much ammunition for it either. So it's not even that you can use it all the time. In fact, if you don't watch out, you might even miss that weapon entirely, but you're not really missing out on all that much. What's also useful, I would say even more useful than the rocket launcher with the seeking ammunition, is an add-on for your stormtrooper rifle that allows you to turn into a sniper rifle, something that we previously didn't have, even though the sniper rifle is, at least at this point, one of the standard weapons you have in a first-person shooter. Not only is that really, really useful, it's also very fun to use to snipe stormtroopers from a distance. The shot is also more powerful. It does eat more energy, but it also is more likely to shoot, to kill most targets in one or two hits. So that's a lot of fun to use. It is useful and it feels novel. So that's definitely the most well-designed new weapon we get, even though it's not terribly creative because sniper rifles are somewhat of a standard weapon in first-person shooters. And but nevertheless, it is a welcome addition. With regard to new monsters or enemies, we do have mostly almost no surprises. That's because most enemies will either carry a weapon around, so they're not really defined by what kind of alien they are. They're just defined by what their weapon they carry, which is fine. And you also have a couple of melee attackers. You have some really evil fish, even though fish appeared in the main game as well. Overall, it's fine. I still maintain that there isn't a whole lot of variety with regard to the non-stormtrooper enemies. The stormtroopers look all the same, which is okay because they wear uniforms. And if within the same ranks, stormtroopers in the films also look exactly the same. But if you have five smugglers and they all are the same type of alien, can't you just change the colors of their of their their clothes? Is it, is it really that much of an effort? Because this is obviously a CD-based game, so it's not like they needed to desperately save space and squeeze this on a floppy disk. And I mean, maybe um, I just lack the technology to to really understand how complicated or not complicated this would be. But flipping out the colors for a couple of textures, I just I just can't believe that is that that is that difficult. But anyway, there's some more variety because you do find find the Imperial Remnant, but through large chunks of the game you also find uh, thugs, criminals, enforcers, smugglers, and other other types of enemies. So the variety feels a little bit better, and that is also welcome. The environments also feel fairly varied in the first act. You do start on a rubber base, but you actually have to destroy an asteroid that is really an Imperial ship which is kind of nice. You do get, once again, a lot of rocky terrain that where it's kind of difficult to see stuff, but it brings in some variety. You also have some more urbanish environments. You've got a palace, which also has a, a slum area where, where people live and stuff. You do have a city. That's actually really nice because you can explore the city. And it's not just a level where you just kill, kill everyone. In fact, until you alert the Imperials in the city, they won't even fight you. That's also nice. And you also have a palace later that's also attached to a city once more. So the areas feel a little bit more lively. There are some civilians running around and everything feels a little bit more alive and breathing like a like an actual living space, which is also very nice. And the exception for that is the fourth act, but for the better. But we're going to get to that. And 
I would say overall the level design is similar to the main game, but it's even more open, which can be good and bad. If you like the exploration part, then it's actually great, but you can also get lost really easily, even in the, in the earlier levels. But it also means that if you want to find all the secrets to get more force points or force stars, you will have an even harder time because some of the levels have a high number of secrets. And in fact, one of them has 11 secrets, which is uh, completely bonkers. That's three more than the eight secrets in which some of the levels in the main game have. And that was already too much, if you ask me. That said, with regard to the force powers, you do have a couple of new force powers, but what's the most important change is that the force powers work differently. You still have the various force powers. You do have four slots you can put into to every force power and the more stars you put into it the more powerful it gets and the exception to that is force defense which costs two stars and the difference is that the force powers now have various tiers there's four tiers and they get unlocked as you play the game advance and invest four stars which does mean that you can't just freely put points into all the powers Instead, you have to wait until later to get access to some of them, which is mostly fine. I don't think it's that necessary because the the power of the various force powers varies a little bit anyway, and the higher tier ones are, in my opinion, not necessarily better. But I kind of like the system here. You also don't get punished for choosing light or dark side powers and switching because this game here does away with the alignment system. You're essentially always on, on the light side. You can stab all the civilians. It won't make a difference in with regard to the the game's plot development and you can you can choose force lightning you won't turn into this which is fine so with regard to the force powers you still have the the old powers with the exception of the ultimate powers for both sides those have changed a little bit there is there are a couple of new powers you do have push which you can use to push people it doesn't work as well as in the sequels it is fine but not terribly exciting i didn't find it quite as useful and you also have a power called projection. That one creates a double of you, and unfortunately, it, it sounds good, but unfortunately, the double is always, always unarmed, or rather, armed only with your fists. So it seems that even the AI is able to tell what the double is. A human in multiplayer obviously won't, will be easily be able to tell what the double is, but even the AI seems to be able to do so. And unfortunately, the the double has trouble getting up elevators in fact that doesn't seem to work at all so the situation would, would be most useful if you just want to surprise someone and present them with two targets while popping out of an elevator shaft there it doesn't really doesn't really work so it doesn't seem to be worth a hassle and at this point i also want to say that invisibility is still very good it's still extremely useful in fact there are some sections where you find multiple enemies with high-powered rifles and auto-aiming rocket launchers, ironically the smugglers, which are better armed than stormtroopers and more dangerous. And just turning invisible and stepping everything, st st stepping everyone with your lightsaber is just so good. I know I keep saying that, but that's because invisibility really is that good, because it's, it's almost invincibility, because if you fight regular mooks, then you, they can't really harm you. They might accidentally shoot you in certain situations, but for the most part it means you can't be seen and you can just step everyone with your lightsaber it is really that useful and not only is it that useful it also makes a lot of other powers mostly redundant and this pull can now be used to pull switches which is nice and will also be used in the sequels with that regard you also have saber throw which is not a standard power as an outcast instead you have to invest in it you do throw your saber which means you can't use it in the meantime you can actually lose your saber but you can just deselect your lightsaber then reselected and magically appears in your hands again it's actually fairly decent should you use that over your regular weapons no but there is a reason why you might want to have it anyway but we'll get to that in a bit and it's also fun to use it looks nice and it's nice to see it slice through enemies we also have farsight farsight is interesting it's, i don't think it's super useful but it's interesting what it does is it essentially freezes your character in, in place and makes it very vulnerable. You probably don't want to use it in multiplayer. But it means you you have uh, some sort of projection that can travel freely. So you can, for example, use it in front of a room, then use your projection to travel into the room. It's invisible and won't be seen or interacted with by, with NPCs and enemies. And you can see what's in the room. 
that's actually fairly useful because there are still plenty of situations where you can step into a room, there's a couple of enemies, you do get shot immediately and you just die a horrible death. And you can avoid it like this. Again, you can also turn invisible. But that said, a far sight is, well, I don't think it's super useful. I think it's kind of fun to use and it's at least very interesting. And you, you can kind of see that it's a mix between seeing far and seeing the future and turning that into a video game mechanic has, in my opinion, been done quite elegantly here and I did like that. There's also Chain Lightning, which now replaces Force Lightning. Chain Lightning shoots lightning, but can jump from target to target. Unfortunately, it's still not that powerful. And it can jump from target to target, but it's very situational. And you may as well just use, just use Blast, Saber Throw, Weapons, or some other power. It is better, but Force Lightning was really bad in the main game, especially because it just ate your Force Power like nothing. And this one here isn't really all that much better, and I didn't find it. I didn't find it fun to use compared to Far Side, which is a bit of a shame. You still have Defend. Defend does take two stars per level, and you can also disable the highest tier powers. So it's a bit weird in that regard, but it does protect you from enemy powers. But since you only have two lightsaber fights in the entire game here, you may want to save that for multiplayer if it's worth using. I'll really leave that to you. And with regard to lightsaber combat, so you do have only two fights in this game here. So you didn't have the situation you had in the main game where you had the seven dark Jedi you'd have to face. And you also don't have the situation in you have in Jedi Outcast where you have elite mooks, yeah, not, not low level mooks, but elite mooks that do have lightsabers and thus will challenge you to regular duels within the levels and not just boss fights, which is a bit of a shame, but it also means that you have less duels, which is good in the sense that, in my opinion, the lightsaber duels were one of the weakest aspects of the main game, and they were a little bit cheap in the sense that your main weapons were a lot more useful, but they didn't really... didn't really work on the enemies because they were just designed in a way that everything you would use except for your lightsaber wasn't effective passive aggressively forcing you to use the lightsaber so i didn't really mind that because the, the lightsaber com combat in my opinion didn't return fun until they released outcast and academy especially if it was a lightsaber to lightsaber the lightsaber is still useful because it's powerful and can kill a lot of things with one hit but it's not not necessarily super fun to use that said, with regard to the force powers, there's a little bit of an issue, and that is the final act. The final is actually actually really nice. So you're looking for Kyle, who went to this temple on a swamp planet. I think the planet Yoda is on. And on that planet, your weapons don't work because the evil Sith energies interfere with your electronics and stuff. Thus, you have to rely on your lightsaber and your force powers. Now, there's a couple of issues with that. So one of them is that there's a couple of enemies that drain your force power. They're actually from the Thrawn trilogy, if I remember correctly. They're a little bit annoying. They're almost impossible to kill because Mara should just be able to stab them with her lightsaber. But you can either just kick them off ledges and get rid of them because in their, in their vicinity you can't use force jump naturally. You can just go away, but there might not be enough space to go away from them, regenerate your force power, and then use force jump and other powers you might need to get to higher places and they can be real really annoying because you should just be able to squish them with your boot or to stab them but it's it's really difficult because they seem to be able to take a lot of damage or it's just too difficult to hit a target that that's small and on the ground it's just a little bit frustrating and annoying but it's not uh, super problematic what is problematic is if you didn't invest enough in your other force powers because you better have force heal at that stage. Maybe if you're really good, but then again, then you probably know how the game works anyway and know all the levels. You might not need it, but if you don't have that, you actually have to have to face a lot of powerful enemies with just your lightsaber. And you can't throw it regularly. That's an outcast thing. So if you did invest in something like force destruction or lightsaber throw or even chain lightning, you might find yourself in a tight spot with your weapons being mainly useless. It feels, it is actually a nice bit of design because you have to use your force powers, but you don't, 
get any warning. It's not telegraphed at all, and you can't reassign your false powers, thus you might end up in a situation where you find yourself unable to progress without a lot of pain, which is a bit of a shame because you can't reset your false power, so you might have to restart the entire game or just go through the pain of doing the level with just your lightsaber and some maybe weak range false powers. But nevertheless, the levels are really greatly designed. There's a swamp, there is a temple, there's catacombs, it's very atmospheric, and you meet some great enemies. You do have some white tiger-like enemies, and those are extremely powerful. They can kill you in one or two hits, and they have they have resistance to a lot of your your weapons. That they are a little bit of a pain to find, but as long as you have force heal, you can always hang around and just heal, and and then uh, just progress when whenever you're ready. With regard to story, uh, the atmosphere is really great. The story is all right. You do have Kyle being seduced by the dark side. Which is kind of which is actually telegraphed because he's wearing black from the beginning of the game, and to be honest, that is always what happens. Luke is at risk being seduced by the dark side in in Return of the Jedi. It also happens again in in the Dark Empire trilogy. You do have that happening to some of the Solo family members. It just happens all the time. It's a Star Wars thing, and even back then, it felt kind of tried. And not really very creative and in my opinion there was almost no surprise the levels are still great but don't really expect any any super exciting twists and turns with regard to the story there and it, it was even recycled from the first the first game or the the base game because even there you have the choice of being seduced by the dark side sort of even though it wasn't really all that well handled in my opinion because it came a little bit out of nowhere that said I would definitely recommend this expansion here if you want to enjoy a little bit more of the single player of Dark Forces 2. And I wouldn't say that the jump in difficulty is all that bad. I found it more difficult than the main game. But that was also because it feels that the difficulty is more even. In fact, for example, the first level is not super difficult, but there's a fair amount of enemies, so you have to watch out a little bit. It's not as easy as the first levels. I found the other, the, the second and third level, fairly challenging. And after that, the difficulty dropped slightly, but not too much. So overall, you have a fairly even amount of challenge, and only the very last levels are, in my opinion, a lot more challenging. So you should, you should check it out, but just be aware it hasn't uh, aged well graphically. Uh, what also hasn't really aged all that well is the soundtrack. You, you do have the Star Wars songs, which are nice, but this is the third game in a row that just uses them, and unfortunately they're not really used all that well. Because what, what happens for the most part is that they just use the songs and have them play in a loop, so occasionally you go down a corridor with no enemies and then Imperial Marsh kit kicks in. It's, it's super dramatic, but there's nothing dramatically happening. And occasionally you do have specific songs playing at specific sections, and they can be quite effective. But that's not always the case. So, and unfortunately, that trend would continue in the future and would also branch out to a couple of other games. I know that the Star Wars soundtrack is really famous and is actually really good, but you can only listen to so much of it, and it would be better if they gave the games their own signature there. But oh well. In any case, that's it from me. Thanks for listening, and I shall see you next time. Take care, and goodbye.